Ben Scorpio here. Thank you for joining me. Our study today is in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and we'll be covering verses 1 to 5. Now, just to get everything in context and put everything in place, I'd like to just give again the outline for this book so we know exactly what themes we're touching upon as we work our way through. There's really three sections or three headings in our outline covering this epistle. And the first is in chapter one, covers the entire chapter and it's encouragement in persecution. Now I already covered this material in a previous video. So if you'd like to review any of that content, I'll leave a link for you in the description below and you can look things over as you please. And then our second heading where we are today is an explanation in prophecy and that covers the entire chapter, chapter two. And then the final chapter, there's only three chapters in the book. It's an exhortation in practice and we'll get to that a little bit later. So we're looking at chapter two verses one to five under the heading an explanation in prophecy. We're not gonna be able to cover the entire chapter, but the material today is simply this. Paul identifies a problem. The problem was is that they were confused about the order of end time events. And then Paul corrects that problem in verses three to five, giving the correct chronology and really referring them back to what he had already taught. Now at Bible Blessings, we cover the Word of God, work through it in study, verse by verse. And there's many advantages to this type of studies. And I think the most important one is, is that it gives us an opportunity to grow and to mature as Christians. Unless we know the Word of God, we don't really know what God's will is for our lives. I've heard it said before, you can't hit a target you can't see. If you don't know what the target is and you take aim, how do you expect to hit that target if you can't see it? So if we study the Bible verse by verse, we get a thorough understanding of who God is, what his will is, and what he has called us to do and what we are responsible for in our walk with God. So it's important in that way. Secondly, it helps us to avoid false teaching. How can we avoid false teaching if we don't know what the truth is? How can we avoid being passed a counterfeit bill if we've never seen a true one? So it helps to see that true one and be really uh, careful to identify what a true bill is and then we can avoid the counterfeit. Isn't that right? Also, it helps us in times of trial. The Christian life is full of tests and sometimes those tests are quite severe. And the more we understand the Word of God, the better we'll be able to cope with those tests. We'll be able to understand what God is like and to be able to put our trust in Him more fully on a mature level so that we can successfully endure whatever trials might arise in the Christian life. So if it, it, if it interests you to study the Bible in this way, I would encourage you to subscribe to Bible Blessings and please hit the notification button and you'll get each video as it comes out in sequence. So let's look at our study today, chapter two, verses one to five. If you have your Bible handy, you can follow along with me. And as I've mentioned already, verses one to two in our study today really present the problem. That's the way many of the books in the New Testament, at least the epistles are laid out. There's a problem that's identified and then a solution, a spiritual solution, or a spiritual correction that's brought forward and taught. So the same pattern applies here, a problem and then the correction. And the correction is Paul gave the proper chronology. Now this is what he says, verse one. Now brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you, not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter as from us, 
as though the day of Christ had come. Now here's the problem, very simple. They thought they were already in the day of Christ. And this was in conflict to what they had understood before when Paul was with them and had taught them in person. They were now confused. They had received some sort of letter, perhaps forged, perhaps bearing the signature of Paul or one of his associates. And now what they were sure of before was called into question. And this letter, which may have had Paul's signature on it or one of his associates, was causing them to question that. And because they were a persecuted church and they were afflicted, and they were in deep trials and tribulations, they were beginning to wonder, well, maybe we are already in the tribulation. Maybe we've missed the rapture. And that was a horrifying thought to consider. So Paul wanted to correct the record. So in verse one, he says this, now brethren concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. Now this is a reference to the rapture. Paul described the rapture in 1 Thessalonians chapter four, verses 13 to 18. He taught that the rapture was not to be preceded by any indicators or signs, but it was a signless event, an imminent event that they were to expect at any moment. And they believed that. How do I know that? Well, I know that because 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10 says this. They were waiting, it describes this in um, verse 9 of chapter 1, 1 Thessalonians. They had turned to God from idols, and now they were waiting for the Son from heaven. And then it goes on to say in verse 10 of chapter 1, 1 Thessalonians, who would deliver them from the wrath which is to come. So when Paul was originally with them and taught them, and they believed him, that the sun would come from heaven without any preceding signs, and that through the rapture, the catching up of the church or snatching up of the church, they would be delivered from wrath to come. Now, some might say, well, how do you know that wrath didn't mean just hell? Or eternal punishment. Wasn't Paul just referring to the wrath of God that comes upon unbelievers? Well, how could it be? They were believers. They were already delivered from the wrath in that sense. So it couldn't be referring to that. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 10, the wrath referred to, the, to there is the day of wrath that the prophets referred to, that the book of Revelation, chapter six to 19 refers to. That's the wrath that believers are to be delivered from. And Paul taught again in 1 Thessalonians chapter four, verse 13 and eight to 18, that the Lord himself would descend with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and the dead in Christ would rise first, and we that remain would be caught up, and we would ever, or they would ever, be with the Lord, delivered from the wrath to come. And this is the gathering that he's speaking about. This is the coming that he's speaking about here in verse 1. So he, he tells them, what I taught you before concerning the rapture, don't be shaken or troubled. Don't get off track. Don't forget what I've taught you. And don't believe what you've read in this forged letter. And he goes on to say, as though the day of Christ had come. It's, and what he's saying in essence here is that you're not in the tribulation. The day of Christ has not come because if this were the day of Christ, then the rapture has already passed. And the rapture is for all believers. That's our gathering together unto him. The dead in Christ, those who preceded 
will be raised up. Those that remain will be caught up to be with the Lord and gathered together with him to those mansions that Jesus spoke about in John chapter 14. So he's telling them very simply here that you are not in the day of Christ. The rapture has not occurred and you can just dismiss whatever these false teachers mention by way of a letter. So he says, let no one deceive you in verse three. Now, how can people deceive us as Christians or how were these people deceived? Well, they were deceived because whatever was written in that letter was not according to the apostles doctrine. It was not what Paul taught. It was in contradiction to what Paul had originally taught them. And if you have your Bible handy, let's look back at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1. And this is what Paul said. He said, But concerning the times and seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I should write to you. The times and seasons that he's referring to is the chronology of end time events. And this is how Paul taught end time events. He taught first, the first event that all Christians should wait expectantly for is a signless event and that event is the rapture. We're not looking for the Antichrist. We're not looking for the signs that will precede the second coming of Christ, which is his coming to set up the millennial kingdom. No, there's no signs to precede the rapture. Christ himself will come and descend from heaven and the church will be caught up. That's the first and the next event on God's prophetic timetable. So he says, as I taught you before, concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you know them already. You need not that I should write for you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord, the time of tribulation will come unannounced. That's my words. So comes as a thief in the night. It will come suddenly. The rapture will appear without sign and the tribulation will commence after the rapture occurs. And Paul says, you know that. You don't need that I write to you again. You already understand it. I've taught it thoroughly, and I can see that you're convinced of it. So Paul had taught them thoroughly and in some detail concerning the order of end time events. But now when we come to chapter two in 2 Thessalonians, because of this letter, they're confused. So he says, let no man deceive you by any means. Well, how were they received? Well, they were deceived by this letter. And it's interesting to notice that just like these Thessalonians were confused about end time events, many people today, many churches, many pastors, many leaders are confused about end time events. There's many theories circulating around. There's a pre-trib rapture, which I believe is the scriptural correct interpretation. There's those who are mid-trib, pre-wrath, and there's many other varieties to be thrown into the mix. Some are all millennialists. They don't believe that there's any millennium. They don't really believe in the uh, tribulation. They don't take the Bible literally. And so there's a lot of confusion. And it gets to the point where people begin to believe that it can't be all untangled. And when we leave out this important doctrine of end time events, Christianity and Christians become very deficient. God wants us to know the chronology of end time events, and he wants us to wait in anticipation of them. So one of the ways that people are deceived today is because of the method of interpretation that we call allegorization. They look at the Bible, and they see the words on the page and they convince themselves that what's literally written there must have a deeper meaning or a symbolic meaning. And so they work to spiritualize the Bible. They're like a detective. They're like Sherlock Holmes. They take out their magnifying glass and they say, I know there's a clue here for some type 
some type of deeper meaning. And this allegorization has a long history and it's very deeply rooted and it's hard to dislodge. It goes back to the third century and it's persisted up until the present day. It's in Catholicism, it's in Reformed theology, and it's in many other denominations. But if we want to understand end time events and we, if we want to understand other Bible doctrines correctly, we don't use allegorization. We reject allegorization and instead we use a historical, grammatical, and literal method of interpretation. And what do I mean by that? Well, when we read the Bible, even in the book of Revelation or in other prophetic scriptures, we read using the regular laws of grammar and we interpret words according to their literal meaning. And I will concede, it is true, there are figures of speech in regular, grammatical, literal writings. There are figures of speech that are used, but it's important to remember that those metaphors or similes will always have an indicator such as like or as. Or in Bible prophecy, it may say sign or signify. And when we see those indicators, then we understand that there is metaphorical language that is used. And when we're in the book of Revelation, I think it's helpful to remember too that if there is symbolic language or a symbol used, in most cases, we're not left to our own imagination to determine what that symbol means, but it's usually explained in the text as you read through it, as you follow down from the symbol. And an example of that is in Revelation chapter 12. It talks about a great dragon. And as we look at that, we'll wonder, well, what could possibly be meant by this symbol? And we scratch our heads and our imagination begins to work. And we begin to think, well, it might mean this and it might mean that. And I wonder what so-and-so said about it. And I wonder what so-and-so over here said about it. And our head can begin to swirl and, con and get confused. But... As I said already, usually the symbol is identified right in the text. And in that case, in Revelation chapter 12, it is interpreted in the text. And that dragon is the devil. I don't need to cook that up in my own mind. It's written right in the text as you follow through and read. If it isn't directly in the text, then that symbol will be identified probably in the Old Testament. For example, the woman that appeared in heaven with the sun and the moon and the 12 stars. We know that that's Israel. How do we know? Some people think it's the church, but we know it's Israel because when we go back to the dream of Joseph, the same symbols were used to signify the nation Israel. So we're never left to our own imagination. Symbols are either explicitly identified in the text or we can refer back to the Old Testament where the symbol was used before and by comparing scripture to scripture we can come to the right conclusion. So we reject allegorization and it's very common in Bible prophecy and it leads to complete confusion and the only hope we have of coming to the right conclusion in analyzing and studying Bible prophecy is to use a grammatical, historical, literal interpretation which compares scripture to scripture. And those that use that method usually come to the same conclusions. There may be a few very uh, variances or variations of interpretation or different hues and color, but the broad outline is always the same when we follow that method. So that's one of the ways or one of the means that people can be deceived. And I want to just mention a couple of others very quickly. Academic credentials and ecclesiastical authority. Some people 
look at a Catholic priest with his robes and his seminary training and his ability to speak in many different languages. He's probably the most educated person in the community. And so whatever he says about the Bible, whatever he says about end time events, who are we to question? Well, I was raised in a Catholic church and I had that outlook too. I went to a Catholic school and I was baptized in a Catholic church and went to church most Sundays until I was about 18 years old. But then when I read the Bible as a young man myself, I read the New Testament, I saw that what the church taught and what the Bible taught were two different things and they were irreconcilable. The church on Sunday morning sang hymns to Mary. And made her into a goddess or the mother of God. But when I read the Bible, I found nothing of that. And I could give many, many more examples. But when we read the Bible, we know it's the word of God, we know it's the truth. And when it c conflicts with ecclesiastical or denominational authorities, we have to go with the Bible. And another thing to mention here too is academic credentials. Someone, a pastor or a teacher or a Bible conference teacher may have many credentials. He may be a seminary graduate. He may be what we call a doctor of divinity. He may have a PhD. He may have a master's degree. He may have advanced studies in Bible prophecy. But is what he is teaching the same as what we read literally in the Word of God or is he using his allegorical skills is he spiritualizing the Bible or is he just teaching denominational traditional doctrine the type of doctrine that goes along with a specific denomination Reformed theology uses allegorization and it's very hard to dislodge them from those traditions. You can show them the verses very clearly. They'll just reject it out of hand. They'll scoff and mock and look at it as nonsense. And so even those with academic credentials, that doesn't ensure that they're teaching right doctrine and they can mislead you and lead you astray. I'm not saying they're doing it intentionally. In some cases, they may be. But in many cases, they're not doing it intentionally. They've been misled. They've been trained in the wrong way. And they're teaching false doctrine, especially on Bible prophecy. And the other one that I'd like to mention too is proof texting. And this is usually found in cults or in false teachers too. They'll throw out one or two verses to convince you that their interpretation is correct. But proof texting is very dangerous because the, the verse is drawn from the Bible, but it's taken out of context and it's hammered in like a square peg in a round hole. It just doesn't fit. If you look at all the scriptures or all the bodies of the complete body of texts that speak on a certain topic, especially Bible prophecy, if you look at them in a comprehensive way, that verse is out of context and doesn't really fit in. We have to look at all that the Bible says on a certain topic and develop our doctrine in a coherent way so that all the pieces fit together. So it doesn't contradict itself and that it's defensible. If our doctrine is self-contradictory, then our opponents will pick a hole in it, tear it down, and it will be indefensible. So these are the ways that people can be deceived, and these Thessalonians were being misled and troubled by a false teacher, by a forged letter it seems, and they were confused and shaken. So Paul says, let no one deceive you by any means. And I've given you the means, or at least some of them, by which they and we can be led away from the truth. And now as we come to the second part of verse three, Paul begins to explain in more detail 
the chronology. And it's not as if he hasn't taught this before. He taught them in a couple of places in the first letter that he wrote. He taught them in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18, and also in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. But here he goes over it again. And he says, unless the day of the Lord has not come, they thought that maybe they were in the day of the Lord, but he says, for that day will not come unless a falling away comes first. Now I'll get to this in a moment. A falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Now, what Paul is saying very simply here is that you're not in the tribulation if you can't identify the Antichrist. The Antichrist will not be revealed in the church age, according to Paul, and according to John too, but he will be made known in the tribulation period, the seventh year tribulation period. So. If someone is teaching, and there are people teaching that, that we're already in the tribulation period, just ignore it. It's very clear in this text and in others that the man of sin must be revealed first. And if the man of sin cannot be identified as if he's not presently on the scene, then you can be sure you're not in the tribulation period. So this is the way Paul worked to convince them. There was a man of sin to come, but he wouldn't be on the scene until the church was taken out. And Paul says here, as I mentioned before, unless a falling away comes first. And some interpret this in different ways. Now, the word falling away here is apostasia. And in the New Testament, the word apostasia, which is a Greek word from which we derive our English word apostasy, usually is identified with false doctrine or spiritual decline or both. And I'm not really sure if that's exactly what Paul is referring to here. Now that's the traditional interpretation among dispensationalists. They usually interpret this as a rebellion that will come about in the last days, but I'm not sure that the context here supports that interpretation. The word ap uh, apostasia can also mean a spatial or a physical departure, as a boat departing from a harbor. And it might also, in this context, be referring to the departure of the church via the rapture. And that interpretation seems to better fit the context. And if that is so, then what Paul is saying here is he's saying, for that day will not come unless the rapture comes first. Now that seems to fit better with our context because he had already talked about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ the personal coming, the Lord himself will descend and are gathering together to him, the rapture, the dead in Christ rising first and we that remain being caught up. So, unless the rapture comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. And that is the exact order. So whatever way you want to take this, you can look into it a little bit further on your own. But I think that the second sort of minority view is more likely to be correct and it better fits the context. A spatial, physical departure via the rapture will come first and the man of sin will be revealed. And this really authenticates the teaching of the pre-tribulation rapture. We're not looking for a mid-trib rapture. Why? Because that would put the church in the same area as the Antichrist. And Paul teaches against that here. He says that can't be. The day of the Lord, which the church has no part in, will be identified by the presence of the Antichrist 
for the man of sin. And this man that's spoken of here is the son of perdition, meaning the son of destruction. Now, John also mentioned an antichrist, and this is what John said. It's in 1 John chapter 2, 18. He said, little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard, the antichrist is coming. Now, it's important to notice that he mentions first the antichrist. Not many antichrists, but one specific antichrist that the Antichrist is coming. He's not here already. You're not in the day of Christ or in the day of the Lord. You're in the church age, but there is an Antichrist, the Antichrist who is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have come, by which we know we are in the last days. There's many Antichrists in the church age, many that oppose the doctrine of Christ, many that oppose the clear teaching of scriptures, many that are opposed to Christianity and antagonize us as believers. But in the tribulation period, there will be the Antichrist. Now, it's very clearly stated in scripture and some people dis dispute that, whether there will be one single man, but Paul speaks of him here as the man of sin or the man of lawlessness, and he will be revealed, he'll be unveiled, he'll be made manifest and he is the son of destruction. He'll have a, uh, a nature that's satanic. He will be indwelt by the devil, and like the devil, he will come to steal, to kill, and to destroy in an unprecedented way. There's been a lot of terrible events in world history, a lot of malicious leaders, murderous leaders, tyrannical leaders, but this man of sin will be in a category all of his own. And in verse 4 it says, He will oppose, or who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or worship. He'll be a man, a man of sin, a lawless man, a man of destruction who will demand worship. And it goes on to say, so that he sits as God, in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And this helps us to understand that he will be literally possessed by the devil. And that's one of the devil's main ambitions, is to be honored as God. And that's why Lucifer, son of the morning, was disposed from his heavenly realm. That's why he was cast down. That's why he fell. And this man of sin, this lawless man, this son of perdition, this son of destruction, he will oppose God. And that helps us to understand his title, the Antichrist. He will be the, the mega Antichrist. There's been small Antichrist before in the church age, but this will be the man of sin, the Antichrist, the unprecedented man of sin, and he will sit as God in the temple of God. Now, this is another indicator to show us that this Antichrist will not come during the church age. And that until he appears, we cannot assume that we're in the tribulation period. Why? Because he sits in the temple of God. What temple of God? Well, there will be a tribulation temple, a temple in Jerusalem that will be erected, that will be a center and place of worship during that time. And this Antichrist, this man of sin, who's yet not on the scene, he's not identifiable, he will sit in that temple and demand worship. So you see now how Paul lays out the order of events. We're not in the tribulation, how do we know? They were not at that time and we are not now. We are still in the church age. How will we know when we've passed from the church age into the tribulation? Well, there'll be a departure. There will be a rapture. The church will be removed. The man of sin will be revealed. The seventh seal, in Re or the first seal of the seven, 
in Revelation uh, chapter 6 will be opened. And that man with the crown will be riding on the white horse, conquering and to conquer, to set up that Antichrist government, the one world government, and eventually he will sit in that temple. And Jesus referred to that in Matthew 24 as the abomination of desolation. And that will not occur during the church age. That tribulation period is yet future. And we as Christians look for the coming of Jesus. We look for our gathering together to him. He will come himself in the clouds. The trump will sound. The dead in Christ will rise first. And we that remain will be caught up. And the man of sin will come on the scene. And in time, he will sit in that rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. And he will demand worship. So this is Dennis Corkery with Bible Blessings. I hope that through today's study, you understand the order of end time events a little bit more clearly. If you'd like clarification on any of the things that I spoke on today, you can leave a comment for me in the comment section below. Leave a request and I'll send you information as you require it. So I want to thank you again for joining me and don't forget to subscribe to Bible Blessing. Rack hole, folks!